Welcome everyone again to another episode of the Idea Me Show that showed the profiles, the humans behind the big ideas that are shaping our world, inspiring the future and future creators. And for all those that like big stories, uh, I'm Ira Pastor, your life sciences ambassador along for the journey today. So uh, here we are, we are continuing our path through the the topics of the diseases of aging uh, and healthy longevity. And we're gonna take a, a fascinating turn today and go upstream from many of the hallmarks uh, and other forms of damage found in aging tissues uh, to one of the very interesting drivers uh, of the aging process, namely the, the retro element space, uh, elegantly termed the retro biome by our guest, uh, which comprises a, a considerable fraction of the eukaryotic genome uh, and for a long time, uh, which was overlooked uh, as sort of junk DNA, uh, but in recent years uh, has become more realized to have very important influence on genome functioning and whose inappropriate activation or inactivation uh, in many ways serves as an internal clock mechanism for determining both aging and a variety of progression of chronic diseases. Uh, today, we're honored to be joined uh, by Dr. Andre Gudkov, uh, who is a preeminent cancer researcher who serves as Senior Vice President of Research Technology and Innovation uh, and is the Chair of the Department of Cell Stress Biology uh, and a member of the Senior Leadership Team for the National Cancer Institute Cancer Center Support Grant at Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. Uh, Dr. Gudkov is responsible for building on both basic and translational research strengths of cell stress biology program in DNA repair uh, damage, uh, photodynamic therapy, thermal hypoxic stress, and immunomodulation. Uh, he assists their president and CEO in developing and implementing a variety of strategies, new scientific programs, enhancing the collaborations of the Institute. Uh, before joining Roswell, uh, Dr. Goodkoff was the chair of the Department of Molecular Genetics at the Lerner Research Institute, the Cleveland Clinic Foundation, and professor of biochemistry at Case Western University. Uh, he earned his uh, doctoral degree in, in experimental oncology at the Cancer Research Center in the former Soviet Union and Doctor of Science in Molecular Biology at Moscow State University. Uh, he's authored over 135 scientific articles. He holds 27 patents. Uh, and aside from all his research, uh, he is a, a serial entrepreneur of sorts. Uh, he has founded Cleveland Biolabs, Oncotardis, Everon Biosciences, uh, as the director and chief science officer for Fanicella Labs, Oncotardis, Everon, uh, Genome Protection Incorporated, uh, Biolabs, uh, and he's also on the board of Incuron LLC. Um, and then, uh, in addition to all that, as if that wasn't enough, uh, Dr. Goodkov is also on the Scientific Advisory Board and founder uh, of the Vika Not-for-Profit Charitable Medical Organization with a focus on extending the health span and lifespan of domestic animals, uh, in this case, aged sled dogs. And that's another very interesting topic that we're going to go into today. Uh, all that being said, Dr. Goodkov, thank you for taking the time to come on the show today and talk to us for a little while. Uh, my pleasure, Ira. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Um, typically, we start off by giving our guests uh, the floor for a little bit just to talk about themselves. Uh, if you could take a little time to just go into your background, sort of you know, where you grew up, how you developed this interest in oncology and molecular biology, and sort of a little bit of your path towards this really unique intersection of uh, aging, chronic disease, and, and this fascinating domain of the retrobiome? Half of my life I spent in uh, the country which does not exist anymore in Soviet Union. Uh, and um, all my uh, academic career uh, steps and major degrees were received there. Uh, uh, in 1990, thanks to um, Gorbachev reforms, I moved to United States. Um, just as a visiting scientist, and my visit lasts till now. Uh, I, um, uh, I have been interested in uh, living creatures uh, from my early childhood, was fascinated mostly by insects, fishes, and uh, all this type of stuff. Had no idea about biochemistry, virology, and always thought that I would never ever be dealing with diseases because diseases is something which uh, evolution should take care of because those who don't fit should die. Uh, 
Mm. And uh, I was interested only in, uh, uh, in, in the norm. Uh, however, it happened um, uh, completely unexpectedly that when I, uh, when I uh, stopped being a student of Moscow State University, uh, a friend of mine, uh, who today is probably one of the best world's known um, bioinformaticians and evolutionary biologist, Eugene Kunin, whom we were classmates, uh, he uh, suggested me to go to the um, Department of Virology, which I was very surprised with, with this. I had no idea what virology is, and that I honestly told him. And he said, well, uh, you will learn it on the way, but meanwhile, just trust me, it's the best department in the in the Faculty of Biology. So we, I simply followed him without knowing what viruses are. And uh, um, after that, my pa it was one of those uh, bifurcations on which probably everybody has on their, um, on their path. Uh, then um, I was fortunate to work with uh, uh, several mentors who were really gigantic scientists, scientists of very high caliber, uh, and with international reputation, even though we lived in a very close country, such as Gary Abelev or Vadim Agol, uh, uh, who were probably the best immunologists and um, virologists of the world at uh, that time and, and, and now in his history of science, respectively. Uh, and uh, I have been working on their um, uh, kind of a boundary between uh, virology, immunology, and cancer pretty much all my life. And that's where my taste was formed. Uh, in 1990, I was a young, at that time, lab head. And uh, when the country became open, I sent all my lab members to different places where we were supposed to spend a year of uh, learning techniques and uh, seeing how others do science, and then come back to Soviet Union to continue work together. But within that year, Soviet Union collapsed, and there was no country to return. So. All of us uh, stayed where we mm, found ourselves at the time. And eventually many of us actually got together and uh, some members of my lab are still working with me now. So, uh, and uh, uh, it happened that I started working with cancer and uh, um, cancer is a, a disease of um, so broad exposure to all areas of biology that uh, in reality, in order to be cancer researcher, you have to be an expert in pretty much everything which mammalian organism can offer in terms of mechanisms. Mm. Uh, and um, but since I was a great graduated from Department of Virology and viruses, being the simplest uh, uh, living organisms, they provide fantastic tools for deciphering mechanisms of uh, solving puzzles of nature. Uh, they um, kept being, uh, you know, kept playing very big role as uh, research tools in all areas, including oncology. And because of viruses, we know uh, that there are oncogenes, for example, mm -hmm. and uh, there would be no modern oncology without uh, without viral research. Sure. Um, but frequently, as happened in science, the uh, interests of uh, certain to, to certain areas goes in waves. Well, for example, now we all live in the era of a tremendous uh, focus on immune therapy. Mm -hmm. And uh, during my long life in science, I watched at least three big waves followed by big dips in mm -hmm. interest to, to uh, immune therapy. Finally, it looks to me that this, uh, uh, that this uh, wave now is probably the <clears throat> reached the uh, stage when uh, it will be irreversible because we already have a number of drugs which work really well in humans. The same thing happened in cancer. Um, at early stage of cancer research, the role of viruses was uh, uh, predicted and uh, partially demonstrated. Uh, one of the uh, first um, cancer models which was ever developed goes all the way back to 1911, when Painton Rouse discovered Rouse sarcoma virus, the virus which caused sarcomas in chicken. Sure. Uh, and uh, uh, this virus played a huge role in uh, in cancer. There are three Nobel prizes, I think, uh, would not uh, would not happen without this virus. Um, and um, uh, uh, but then uh, in 80s, 60s, 70s, and beginning of 80s, 
viruses and specifically retroviruses were the drivers of oncology uh, at that time. And then after that, uh, there was a big deep in interest. Uh, so because everybody was start focusing on the cells. Um, and uh, right now, I think we are watching this return. I think we are now at the stage when suddenly we start looking at viruses again. Uh, it's not only because of COVID, it's a coincidence, and, uh, but definitely appearance of AIDS and HIV and the fact that humanity uh, faced with, uh, uh, with met COVID-19 uh, helped to focus interest on viruses, but it's not, but it would happen even without that. <clears throat> we, I think, start appreciating uh, more and more that viruses played the big role of creators of us. Uh, I think it's enough uh, illustration would be, strong illustration of that would be to say that approximately 50% of length of our DNA mm -hmm. consists of viral-like elements. Elements which either retain ability to be capable of replication and have their selfish agenda, or they had this ability before they extinct and acquired mutations which uh, inactivated them, but they still carry the uh, like archaeological remains, the um, indications that they were viruses at some point of evolution. Uh, so that's, uh, and uh, I've been fascinated with um, viral components of our DNA uh, from my early steps in science. My PhD thesis was uh, devoted to characterization of um, endogenous viruses who live in the genome of uh, birds. Uh, then for many, many years, I was doing other things. And uh, then um, about maybe 10 years ago or so, my research focus returned back to, uh, to viruses uh, as a result of uh, my interest to the questions um, we are all, the whole world tries to solve is what is the source of ongoing genomic instability, DNA damage, which is happening in our organism every single moment of our life, it which, as many believe, is the uh, reason for the gradual increase in uh, frailty, uh, increasing risk of diseases, and finally death, mm -hmm. which we all together name aging. It's a... Um... It's a really fascinating domain, which, as you when you point out, this has been 65 million years of this um, integration going on, and and this uh, these ancient frag you know, fragments of, of, of viruses that uh, have in many ways sort of shaped um, how how things have gone in terms of these phenotypes and so forth uh, over time. Um, you know. I've, I've been very, you know, fascinated by your work, and uh, as you know, you have spoken uh, quite eloquently a lot about the uh, connections um, to aging uh, over the past. And you, uh, you know, you wrote this, you know, very nice. Um, there's a recent paper in Innovation in Aging uh, entitled "The Aging Treatment by Counteracting Intrinsic DNA Damage and Immunosenescence," uh, where you sort of, you know, you craft this fascinating. Um, connection to a topic that we've discussed a bit on the show, uh, namely senescence, um, where, you know, you talk about this uh, progressive sort of systemic poisoning event that is occurring by these senescent cells that are uh, accumulating, um, yet you, you take a much more, uh, let's say, integrated view of it as opposed to um, some that are just coming at this that, well, all we need to do is destroy these cells. Uh, you're looking at it from the perspective that uh, you have DNA damage, uh, you have the uh, desilencing of, of these retro elements, and then you also have this very fascinating connection to uh, immunosenescence that you know, the normal innate immune response is not doing its job. Could you talk a little a bit about this sort of this three way, this triad of um, you know, this three-way storm that's coming together in terms of uh, senescence and how you look at the problem a little differently than just uh, throwing senolytics at it. 
well, uh, there was a number of terms which you just uh, threw, which I'm not sure 100% uh, people could catch. Uh, let me just comment a little bit on this terminology, and then I will try to um, answer as good as I can um, address your questions. Uh, well, first you said that uh, this um, massive uh, invasion of uh, endogenous retro elements, and the reason they name retro elements is not because they are old, although many of them are old, but because their method of replication involves the process named reverse transcription, okay. uh, similar to what HIV virus does. So they uh, live in genome as pieces of DNA, get transcribed into RNA. The, RNA, the RNA encodes the enzyme which can copy RNA into DNA, uh, and this is kind of reverse uh, process to what normally happens in the flow of genetic information. That's why it is named reverse transcriptase. Mm, and then the resulting D cDNA, uh, DNA which results from this process, is integrated back into DNA. That's the very a uh, uh, simple way how to explain how this virus is replicated, which means that uh, they do not, the initial copy does not get lost, it stays where it is, but it can generate new progeny, new places of genome through this process. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, um, we have about half of DNA consisting of these highly repetitive families of sequences. Uh, and indeed, you are right. A good proportion of them, but far from all, uh, start originating. So the first explosion of their appearance in our DNA happened uh, about 65 million years ago. Uh, and this is a very interesting time in life of this planet because it's exactly the time when uh, the face of Earth uh, animal wise changed from the uh, the dominance of uh, of uh, reptiles and uh, starting the uh, era of mammals. Mm -hmm. So uh, the dinosaurs died uh, and uh, mammals start to prevail. Sure. Uh, in mammals' life, it's not only the moment when mammals uh, start uh, being dominant in terms of occupying uh, niches and uh, multiplying in numbers but also it was the moment when there was a tremendous amplification of morphological variants of mammals. Okay. So if you would go 70, 80 million years back and try to uh, create a zoo uh, with, you know, you would never have, uh, you will have a beautiful zoo of uh, reptiles, right. and amphibians, but you would not have very exciting zoo of mammals. Because according to paleontological evidence at that time, there were not that many species of mammals and all of them looked quite boring, very quite similar to each other. So all these creatures like giraffes, whales, uh, hippos, you know, uh, bats and you name them, uh, they appeared during a very short evolutionary time, still very long if compared to our longevity, but from the evolutionary standpoint, it was an explosion. It was a, uh, during very few millions of years, suddenly the whole zoo appeared. Mm. And uh, uh, meaning that at that moment of time, evolution was enormously creative. <clears throat> creative in constructing uh, new uh, archetypes, new forms of, <clears throat> of bodies. Um, so uh, what, uh, after that, by the way, there was a long period of time during which evolution did not invent much in terms of new mammalian forms. Definitely, there was adaptive evolution when, uh, I don't know, dolphin and whale uh, separated from each other, hamster, mouse, and rat, uh, monkeys, apes, uh, humans, uh, but it was already adaptation and uh, divergency within pre-existing archetypes. There was no creation of brand new creatures with completely new forms as if certain one type of evolution was followed by uh, uh, by a completely different type of evolution. So that, that second type, when you have just adaptation to specific niches, uh, really very well described by Darwin's evolution. Mm -hmm. While this creation of these uh, creatures with different forms 
it is not that easy to explain with at least with a primitive way of looking at Darwin's uh, Darwin's laws. So, um, what, and trying to solve this puzzle, uh, we may actually mm, look in our genomes and to see what exactly happened at that time when this uh, amplification of diversity of species and archetypes occurred. Uh, you may say, how can you do that? We don't have time machine to travel that that far back, but Actually, we do. Uh, uh, we do because we have um, very well defined uh, phylogenetic tree. We know, based on paleontological and other evidence, when uh, exactly uh, different uh, subfamilies of mammals separated from each other. Uh, we also have examples of these mammals who survived till today and carry in their genomes those events mm -hmm. which led to their separation from other species. Uh, and But we would not be able to do anything and to make any conclusions based on the analysis of modern genomes if there would be no very interesting rule in mammals evolution and evolution of eukaryotes in general that evolution of mammals goes without genetic losses. There is no massive loss of genes. So which means that when we need to adapt to a new uh, environment, env environmental change, and we invent something, we, cre we create new genes or modify pre-existing genes, but we always do it putting these new ones on top of pre-existing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there is, uh, unlike bacteria who always lose unnecessary stuff as garbage, uh, we are carrying all this baggage with us uh, through millions and dozens of millions of years, that that part which becomes useless starts acquiring mutations and uh, uh, lit little by little turn itself into archaeological remains, becoming non-functional, but physically it is there. And we can find it there, and we can uh, restore the past based on this. So to a certain degree, our genome is a great... Uh, archaeological site with tremendously well-preserved events which happened throughout our evolution with practically no losses of information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So looking, and that allowed us to restore the events which happened 65 million years ago in which at least time-wise coincided with um, this appearance of this arch uh, archetypical diversity. So a um, few words about this, what I named the retrobiome. I think it is, it, this, this is indeed my term. Uh, it has not become yet, and I hope it will, the well accepted one. Um, I like but I think uh, it's good because I think half of our DNA deserve a term. Uh, and uh, um, uh, there are several families of, in our retrobiome, two major ones. Uh, historically named lines and signs, mm -hmm. uh, abbreviations standing for short and long interspersed nuclear elements. So uh, between these two, uh, in terms of occ occupancy, the, how much of DNA they occupy, uh, the biggest one are lines. They occupy about 20% of human DNA, and we have approximately half million copies of them. Um, as I said, majority of these copies are technically dead because they acquired mutations on the way, but uh, about 150 copies in humans are still technically alive, although very strongly repressed by our cells in order to prevent them from amplification. Uh, but if they are awake, they technically can start uh, creating new progeny. Uh, and um, Mm, uh, lines are, did not appear 65 million years ago. They have been with us long before that. And uh, these virus-like elements, they spread out all um, uh, members of living organisms we know, uh, in eukaryotes at least, and uh, in, in different forms and uh, variants. Uh, but only in mammals they become so abundant. They indeed, remarkable because all of them encode reverse transcriptase. So if anybody would ask you, what is the most repetitive gene in our DNA? Some people will say, okay, it's ribosomal RNA genes. 
it's others would say it's tRNA or it's histone, or it's, excuse me, histone genes or, or something like that. And all of them would be wrong because the biggest family of uh, we have is reverse transcriptase. Uh, although majority of it is uh, killed by mutations, but still in terms of homology, we have about half million copies of reverse transcriptase in our DNA in the form of this virus, viral element. So uh, lines uh, were spreading out and accumulating in genome very gradually. Yes, there were some explosions on the way, but there was no one or few massive big explosions. However, there is another part of uh, elements named signs. Signs are very short elements. They uh, cannot encode proteins. They do not encode proteins. They are, if you wish, parasites on lines. They are using, they are using reverse transcriptase of lines to amplify. They um, originate from RNA, uh, from, the, from the genes which normally encode short uh, functional RNAs, such as tRNAs, 7SL RNAs, RNAs which is very useful for the cell's function. The reason they um, start being so abundant uh, is because unlike genes encoding proteins, uh, these short um, RNA coding genes have their, have their promoters inside coding regions, meaning that if you make DNA copy of such RNA and integrate it back, it would become functional again. So basically, this, uh, when you start making reverse transcription of tRNA, you are creating a primitive virus because every new uh, copy of this um, the tRNA would be functional again and create a, a new gene. So uh, the moment this process starts, uh, you start having Darwin selection for those elements which would be better fit that existing reverse transcriptase which they find around. And finally, through mutations, they will generate uh, RNA which will so well fit this RNA that it starts uh, amplifying them in an explosive manner. And that's exactly what happened. And this process indeed initiated about 65 million years ago. We do not know today what was that event which turned normal, uh, benign, useful genes such as tRNA and 7SL RNA into technically dangerous high risk population of genes which could, could generate virus-like elements and start invading into our genomes in hundreds of thousands and finally millions of copies. But it happened 65 million years ago. And indeed, we uh, as a species, as humans, we survived probably uh, from four to seven very big evolutionary explosions of these sign amplifications which all together created the subfamily of uh, sequences, which in humans named ALU sequences, um, which uh, we have about 1,100,000 copies in our DNA, spread out all over the genome, but obviously not sitting inside coding regions, because all those of us, of our ancestors who had them in coding regions are no longer with us, they are dead. <laughs> so the, mo the reason I'm explaining all that is very simple. When you have situation, when there is an organism with a very compact genome, with uh, uh, lots of very well working in concert protein coding genes, and suddenly they, uh, they found themselves in pandemic situation when um, some small gene starts amplifying and inserting randomly all over the places. You're obviously in danger of extinction because obviously if essential uh, genes get interrupted, uh, it may be not, you know, maybe lethal. But also these things can work as gene modulators because when they uh, integrate into promoter region, into enhancer region, or they create proteins slightly changed in their structure, they can generate uh, basically freaks, malformed creatures because the concert of gene, which was evolutionary balance, suddenly become misbalanced with that. So, which means that appearance of this type of insertional mutagenesis creates situation of very high creativity of evolution, mm -hmm. which simply creates lots of lethality, but lots of freaks. And who are freaks? Freaks are those who sometimes can fit very nicely certain niche. 
and then they start, and then if, especially if there is a big extinction around them, those who survived at least somehow, then stay and they adapt to the place where I could find the place where to live. Mm -hmm. For example, if you uh, were a creature similar to a rat, for example, but you acquire a number of insertions which simply turn your limbs uh, into little protrusions, which no longer can maintain your walking, the only place you can live is the ocean. <laughs> so I wouldn't be surprised that this is the way how uh, how whales or dolphins, uh, you know, appeared. Sure. Or if or if you have a mutation which makes your neck tremendously long, you end up being a giraffe. And thanks God you have long trees where you can find something to eat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you see uh, here we are reverting to a certain degree the primitive understanding of how evolution works, uh, saying that first there is a there is a competition and there is a mm, lack of resources in certain niche and in order to occupy another niche you acquire a new trait and this trait makes you fitting this new new niche b very well uh, such as predecessors and ancestors of giraffes ate up all the leaves on bushes and only those who had long necks survived because they could eat something on uh, very highly mm -hmm. uh, uh, what i think happens with the presence of retro elements is that you simply create lots of very strange looking uh, creatures. Some of them happen to find the way how to survive. Mm. And this was the way how the zoo, according to my impression, uh, was formed. So all this is, becomes very interesting. So we inherited this very interesting bag baggage. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but then we had to live with that. In order to live with that, we somehow, uh, as with any, like with COVID infection, with plague, with syphilis, with, uh, with cholera. There is a, a kind of um, evolution uh, which goes both sides. A parasite, parasite evolves to become more benign and the host uh, evolves to be, become more protected, right? So you, very, you certainly know very well that syphilis when it was brought from South America by uh, Spanish can conquistators mm -hmm. was really a deadly uh, and uh, basically lethal disease uh, which killed millions of people all over Europe. Yeah. Little by little it turned itself not too pleasant and not too benign but still much less severe disease. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, well the same thing happened with pretty much every parasite we passed, uh, we passed through. Um, and um, mm, uh, before we learned how to uh, counteract it with science. Um, the same thing happened in our evolution with retro elements. I will live under conditions of mutual evolutionary agreement between retro elements and us. Okay. They, agree, they agreed to be benign and amplify very rarely. Uh, uh, and we uh, developed plenty of mechanisms to be resistant to them. This, we know, I think, at least 10 different mechanisms, uh, which we found, and I'm sure that there are more which we acquired during evolution in order to protect ourselves from dangerous uh, consequences of waking this retrobiome up. Mm -hmm. uh, one, uh, the number one of which is actually very interesting, and this is um, size of our DNA. Okay. Because as you probably know, uh, if you look at the protein coding uh, part of our DNA, uh, it's like few percent of its length, I think two or four percent, something like that. All the rest are uh, introns, intergenic species, so you can add there some functional regions too, but still it would not exceed 10 percent of something which we consider useful. Right. The, the rest would be something which we name differently. Uh, at some point it was uh, a habit to name them genomic junk, uh, but it's one thing is clear. Our uh, genome is archipelago of uh, coding regions which are like islands spread out in a huge ocean of something which does not make big sense to us today. You may ask why we are so not economic. Why do we bother replicating like crazy this in billions and trillions of cells uh, and re using lots of energy and resources to copy it? So obviously it's absolutely technically unfeasible. But if you think that we are progeny of those who survived 
following massive invasion of repetitive elements mm -hmm. at the time when hundreds of thousands of them during a short evolutionary time attacked our DNA, who had the high chance to survive? Those who had a compact genome with absolutely zero uh, you know, empty space between the genes, or those who have a plenty of uh, fields where these elements can in intervene without causing any problem? I think answer is obvious. So, uh, and um, this is, I think, one, number one protect, protection. Number two is, of course, that these genes, these repeats are under very strict epigenetic control, which means that they are wrapped in the chromatin, which does not allow them to be active, to, uh, does not allow transcriptional machinery to find them and to start their transcription. They are not visible to the uh, gene expression driving machinery of the cell. And this is, uh, again, a very well uh, manifested in majority of cells, but as any epigenetic regulation, sometimes does not work. And uh, we have trillions of cells, and sometimes few of them here and there uh, make mistakes and allow access of transcriptional machinery to this uh, to these uh, repeats, allowing them to stay to wake up and start doing what they're supposed to do. And this will be the uh, main topic of our explanation of what is happening during aging. Okay. So, <clears throat> uh, but even, uh, even after they are allowed to get expressed, uh, after that, there we know at least several mechanisms which uh, are stopping them, either at the level of destroying the RNA or at the level which blocks translation of this RNA, Mm -hmm. or at the level of allowing this RNA or its cDNA going back into the nucleus, or <clears throat> at the level of killing cells which happen to allow these elements to uh, get activated to live. We all know what is, that is such thing as interferon. Interferon is a, we, we all learn that interferon system is part of our innate immunity, mm -hmm. which protects us from viruses. And we are alive uh, because we are alive because of multiple defense mechanisms. But I can tell you that if no, if not interferon system, each of us would be dead in the current environment. I don't speak about COVID. I speak about all other viruses sure. circulating around within a few days. It's proven. It's not a. Uh, it's it's not a <clears throat> kind of hypothetical prediction. Uh, we have mice which. Uh, deficient in interferon response, and these mice live can live only in uh, um, sterile conditions, and they yeah. die with, within like few, very shortly when you put them under uh, natural conditions. There are plenty of viruses around them who are not killing us because we have uh, interferon response, and interferon response plays a very important role in protecting us from these endogenous retro elements as well. The reason for that is because, as I explained, they are replicating by creating cDNA copies, and this is happening in cytoplasm. And when the cell finds in its cytoplasm free DNA, it automatically considers that it is under attack of a virus. There is no free DNA in cytoplasm, period. There is only one type of DNA in cytoplasm, but it's inside mitochondria. <clears throat> and But if there is a DNA which is outside of mitochondria, this is a signal to induce interferon. There is a special pathway named CGAS sting pathway, which uh, and there are several others, which uh, detect this free DNA and activate interferon response. And this interferon response is the way to tell the immune system by the cell I am in danger. I deserve to be killed. Mm -hmm. I deserve at least attention to be looked at. And if this is accompanied with the appearance of antigens, this cell will be under immune attack and death. So, uh, and uh, um, all, all this, uh, I, I, I kind of drew the picture to you that we live with tremendously uh, dangerous content in our DNA. Right. This content formed us, uh, they, it was most likely responsible to the way how we look. Uh, and uh, it determines our existence and presence and 
it at some points determined our ability to evolve and solve evolutionary problems. But at the same time, it creates a huge risk of uh, genomic instability, mm -hmm. which can drive not only appearance of bad cells which start inducing inflammation and uh, uh, you know, alerting immune system to uh, find and kill them, but obviously genomic instability equals risk of cancer. Sure. Because cancer is a disease of somatic cells which become genetically modified and epigenetically modified to uh, start exploring selfish agenda and uh, going stepping uh, up to the path of evolution from uh, from um, citizens, from good citizens to criminals, basically. Uh, and uh, this is happening because of genomic instability. So the bottom line is that in our cells, we have the mechanism which drives genomic instability, and it is encoded in our genes. When we try not to smoke, not to drink, not to be on the direct sun, uh, not to be irradiated, not to eat uh, uh, drugs which cause uh, food which causes oxidation, and so on and so forth, making our life a little more boring. And uh, 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 we think that we can avoid uh, genomic instability. We can, but in my opinion, it's minuscule win. Uh, you know, uh, min minuscule victory which uh, we may have over the massive genomic instability drivers which are walking in our DNA mm -hmm. constantly and which we cannot control by our living habits. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the, just to make from all what I told you the uh, kind of summarizing picture. Sure. We, live, we live with a situation when every cell in our body has a chance to turn itself into the cell with genomic instability, uh, and uh, which is driven by the activity of retro elements, which periodically get and spontaneously get activated as a result of failure of mechanisms which normally keep them negatively regulated. They start creating uh, DNA damage. And by the way, I mentioned that they create DNA damage by insertion of themselves into DNA, mm -hmm. but they do it in many other ways. Okay. Because, because in order to get inserted into DNA, they need to make a hole in DNA first. And uh, they have special endonuclease, which does create holes in DNA, uh, creating the pressure of as if there would be a piece of uranium in such cell. Um, also, when you create new copies of elements, uh, they, this provokes homologous recombination between these areas, which provokes deletions and amplification. So basically, Activation of line one elements leads to super mutagenic state of the cell, mm -hmm. uh, which provokes cancer and uh, requires immune system to find it, recognize it, and 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 kill it. So this is the mechanism. Uh, the, this is the danger we live with, and it looks like from this point I am uh, turning into hypothetical, predictive kind of mode. Uh, uh, up to this moment, I pretty much was metaphoric, but still quite accurate. Uh, not everywhere, but because obviously my evolutionary, um, you know, reconstructions, uh, they, uh, they, they are convincing to me, but they have not been proven yet. But from the point of view of uh, viral replication and the dynamic of the occurrence, I was accurate. Now, now from this moment of time, I will explain things hypothetically. Uh, and this hypothesis is being tested by us and by okay. others, probably. If uh, we have in our cells constantly ongoing process of uh, creation of bad cells which have to be eliminated, mm -hmm. we can predict that this is a job of immune system. Right. This is a very well, uh, although it's hypothetical, uh, message, but I think it's uh, common sense tells us that it's most likely true. Yeah. And the fact that these cells activate interferon gives you the hint how uh, immune system recognizes that these cells exist. Right. Because it, interferon response is the way to be a beacon to attract uh, attention immune system to these cells. So, but immune system with age changes. 
it is it is known very well. Sure. It is ma manifestation of these changes is uh, uh, well best known for inability of old people to be effectively vaccinated. Sure. Today, even today, Food and Drug Administration requires to give double shot or double dose of flu vaccine to people above 65 years old mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as a matter of compensation for immunosenescence which people acquire uh, during their life. Immunosenescence, even though it is a very well established phenomenon, is far from being well deciphered mechanistically. Sure. Today, believe it or not, we do not know what is the driver of this immune senescence? Uh, uh, most people, uh, most typical thinking is that immune system gets exhausted. Mm -hmm. So it's simply uh, as everything in our body, uh, which uh, you cannot, does not have like immortal life, uh, every cell with after too many divisions will finally, uh, you know, use up all the telomeres, for example, which were given and its progeny no longer can melt, uh, amplify, get senescent. And uh, that is why people frequently think that immunosenescence is a result of cellular senescence of components of immunity. Well, I honestly believe that the uh, situation is actually better, because if it would be true, as I just said, it would be quite hopeless, because it means that you cannot rejuvenate something which is already completely broken. Mm. However, we do have experiments which we are already demonstrating in our FDA applications, in our um, uh, grant applications, but have not uh, has not published have not published yet, demonstrating that we have a reagent which we can give to old animals which are completely immunosenescent and cannot be vaccinated, and a single shot of this agent can actually uh, return uh, animals back to the state where they can be vaccinated again. And that gives very interesting opportunity for uh, under current circumstances of COVID-19 because COVID-19 is a disease of aging sure. uh, from the point of view of risk of lethality. <clears throat> so, um, however, I uh, really want us to, uh, 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 yes, so the bottom line is that immune senescence exists, uh, it can be reverted. And uh, we are learning quickly what it is. And when we understand what it is, we probably will have, uh, will be able to do it even better. I mean, revert. Mm -hmm. But w can we do anything else? Can we, do, because obviously, look at, look at viral diseases, look at COVID situation. What people are trying to do in face of this pandemic? They're trying to do pretty much three things. Uh, one is to, uh, try to develop antiviral drugs, sure. drugs which would suppress certain essential components of viral life, viral replication cycle. Let's say RNA polymerase, for example. Okay. The sec uh, this is a good, good direction. We have several quite well working uh, antiviral drugs, like everybody knows the cyclovir, for example, for herpes. Sure. Um, uh, but not that many. Surprisingly, we have much less number of antiviral drugs than viruses. So, so far it was not very easy to do because viruses are so well integrated into cellular system that almost anything which suppress them suppresses something good in the cells. Uh, much more, uh, much higher impact in uh, battle with viruses was played by immunization, vaccination. Sure. Massive vaccination, you know, smallpox, polio, you name it, like uh, uh, measles, you know, uh, all major uh, viruses, flu, who created pandemics before, now under control of massive worldwide vaccination. Vaccination works prophylactically. Right. It rarely can work uh, like only with rabies. It works uh, because it's so so slowly developing disease that you can start vaccination already being infected. Mm -hmm. But in majority of cases, you cannot do that. So this is number two, which is uh, basically alerting your immune system and making it pre uh, prepared for the, uh, for the viral attack. And the third one, which is uh, 
being tested in multiple places is to use uh, viral and neutralizing antibodies as immunotherapy to um, those who are already infected. So these are pretty much three things which can be done. So now if we look at retrobiome, and we look at retrobiome as a, uh, you know, a risk of disease, which we all carry, and 100% of us develop this disease because the belief is that when we acquire immune senescence, our immunity no longer can take care of those cells which activated the retrobiome. Okay. And they start amplifying in tissues. And if they get amplified, it means that we have more and more cells with activate interferon signaling. These cells become abundant. They drive chronic systemic inflammation with no obvious cause. Mm -hmm. And we all know that aging and inflammation are really connected. And uh, uh, and uh, uh, finally, when we have chronic systemic inflammation, it drives uh, multiple diseases, including cancer, mm -hmm. arthritis, Alzheimer's disease, uh, you name it. Uh, and uh, altogether leads to uh, progression of frailty and death. So this, the picture looks very attractive because it gives you the way out. The way out is let's help organism to control these cells. And by the way, all this uh, business around senescent cells as being drivers of aging, and all this business around senolytics, uh, or compounds which can kill cells which become senescent in the body, they fit really nicely the picture which I'm drawing right now. Mm -hmm. I simply suggest that majority of senescent cells we acquire are generated through this mechanism. So there is no contradiction. I'm not contradicting senescent cell theory. I'm just adding explanation sure. to the source of DNA damage, which drives cells into senescence, and immunosenescence, which uh, can, can uh, explains why they're not being eliminated effectively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if we know the source, maybe now, instead of helping to kill these cells, which is a very difficult thing to do, right. Because there are plenty of tissues. Every tissue has cells of its own or type. And uh, it's, we, now people who are in the senolytic business are coming collectively to the understanding that for each type of aging tissue, they need to develop its own drug. Sure. And it's becoming, as always, like very... Uh, uh, although, in principle, the theory of senescent cells is a completely admirable uh, demonstration of how a uh, brilliant idea eventually uh, brought the science to completely new opportunities. So I, I think the biggest credit should go to uh, Judy Campisi, who um, in the uh, 90s uh, was, um, has been the, the best advocate for that. And he, this brilliant idea was, is around, would not be around without, without her. So, but uh, everything I'm telling is built on top of that. It's not an alternative. It's not contradiction. So, um, and uh, uh, that means that if we overcome immune senescence, we can help uh, do the senolytic job. We can do the clean organism from senescent cells. And we already have in the lab data demonstrating that compounds which revert immunosenescence can effectively help eradication of senescent cells. But being viruses, the elements we're talking about they also can be the target for pharmacological suppression. Sure. And they all depend on reverse transcriptase. And the reverse transcriptase has a number of uh, enzymatic activity, including polymerase, which I already highlighted, but also they have this endonuclease activity, the ability to break DNA for integration, yep. which also requires uh, suppression. So, which means that <clears throat> uh, if indeed aging is connected to the activation of this part of our DNA. And if aging is indeed then can be named viral disease, if you wish, which we all inherit and carry in our genes, then you need to develop antiviral drugs, which would target reverse transcriptase and endonuclease of line one elements in order to preserve the organism from amplification of these elements and stopping it if it is already happening. So, and here we came to the situation 
when uh, we found ourselves in a very fortunate position because of AIDS situation and several decades scientists uh, used to develop antiviral drugs against mm -hmm. other type of retrovirus, which also driven by reverse transcriptase, very different from line one, but still reverse transcriptase. It appears that some of the, some of the drugs which were developed against HIV happened to be quite effective against line one reverse transcriptase. Okay. And we and others were able to directly prove that use of this universal reverse transcriptase inhibitors, which were actually bad drugs for HIV, because obviously every, every drug wants to be selective, right? Since they are, uh, they are working with a different enzyme, it means that they're not selective and they have more side effects. So these are kind of primitive drugs, but for, fortunately for us, the, some of them already were generated at early stage of HIV battle. And we could use preclinical models to demonstrate that we can revert uh, in animal models of premature aging, revert uh, the manifestations of aging and delay aging and prolong life of such mice by using reverse transcriptase inhibitors. We published that in a recent paper with uh, which came out uh, predominantly from the lab of Vera Gorbunov and Andrei Siluanov in mm -hmm. University of Rochester, mm -hmm. where we uh, happened to be uh, collaborators with. And simultaneously, there was a paper in Nature by, by John C. Davis Group, University of Maryland, who demonstrated that uh, pretty much similar thing, but uh, they demonstrated that good part of that pro-inflammatory factor secretion by senescent cells is driven by uh, actually interferon response as a result of recognition of ongoing process of replication of line one element. So, which means that even though I said that I will be hypothetical, there are plenty of already uh, important support generated for this hypothesis as we speak and being generated right now. So all of this brought us to the uh, point uh, which you mentioned in the beginning. And uh, I think it's time maybe for us to explain what we're already doing in order to check whether we can <clears throat> use these old drugs to rejuvenate somebody. Okay, and uh, I think this is a good segue for, uh, to talk about the VICA project. Um, so, you know, we have, as you outlined, just, you know, once again for the audience, um, retrobiome management via pharmacological interventions, uh, immunostimulation, and then this area that you mentioned of retrobiome vaccination, uh, via induction of, of immune responses against cells that have uh, inappropriate uh, retro element dynamics. Um, now let's go into the VICA project. You have, um, once again, uh, and you have this very elegant slide in your presentation about this tremendous amount of uh, phenotypic variety in these things that we call dogs, uh, a Great Dane and a Chihuahua and a Pit Bull and so forth are all dogs. And you know, we have nonetheless, the retro elements are different and, and they look very different and, and so forth. Um, you're gonna be uh, working with um, the Cornell College of Veterinary Medicine. You have uh, dogs that have, um, have been pulling sleds for eight to 10 years. They're happy, they're healthy, but they're older. Uh, what's going to be going on with this project? Because it's, it's clearly extremely fascinating and it, and it definitely moves beyond mice uh, into much larger animals where you're going to get a lot of fascinating data. Yes, indeed. Uh, this is probably one of the most exciting projects of my life and uh, clearly the most unusual and the most unique. So first of all, uh, let's speak about dogs. Sure. Uh, we all love dogs because they are best friends uh, uh, of, of humans for thousands and thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And uh, dogs and humans, they basically form their, uh, our civilization would be different without dogs. So, um, but dogs are interesting for a biologist from a different standpoint. Okay. If you try to think is there any other species among mammals, or not even mammals, you may name any family of uh, eukaryotes, 
which within one species would have so many archetypes, so many morphological forms? Yep. And the answer will be very, very clear. No, there is nothing comparable. Humans during their civilization domesticated uh, quite a few animals, horses, donkeys, cows, uh, cats, uh, you know, pigeons, you know, you name it, mm -hmm. uh, chicken. Yes, there are certain breeds which, uh, uh, which are different. There are mini horses, mini pigs, there are uh, ponies, uh, there are, you know, cats with different appearances, uh, naked and so on. But everything, all this diversity is incomparable to what you see within species named domestic dog. Mm -hmm. Even in size, even in shape, even the fact that they, but the fact that they, well, you may say why they are still considered as a single species, very simple. They can breed together. Mm -hmm. They can generate uh, progeny. So which means that at the molecular level, the level of chromosomes, uh, they are the same. They are they belong to the same species. There is no reproductive isolation <clears throat> within uh, within all the, these breeds. So uh, to a certain degree, human ability to create diversity of dogs, which I think by themselves can create a very interesting zoo, right? Can you imagine zoo of dog breeds? Mm, yes. um, uh, I think it's uh, uh, it would be worth it. And lo lo looking at that, you will be fascinated with how our uh, kind of artificial selection, what it can do. But at the same time, artificial selection could not do that with other species. It means that there is something different in the genetics of dogs, which allows us for them to be so, so as to have reached such a high degree of plasticity. Okay. And uh, um, uh, when you look, uh, in, and we know a little bit of, about that, but a little bit, but enough to make a very important conclusion. Because if you look in literature, dog genome was not the main focus of genetics, but still it's, reasonably well studied uh, and there is a number of uh, inherited traits of breeds for example flat nose of a boxer or short legs of corgi or dachshund mm -hmm. uh, the uh, genes which encode these traits they were mapped first during breeding you know by classical genetics and then these areas of genome were cloned, sequenced, and identified what exactly the mutation is. And I can tell you that practically every trait of that kind, which determines morphological peculiarity of certain species, appears to be a certain retro element sitting in a new place of DNA. Mm -hmm. So that actually is a great uh, supporter uh, of um, my uh, hypothesis that morphological diversity of mammals that occurred 65 million years ago is also driven by similar process. So to a certain degree, the creation of diversity of breeds of dogs proves that by a massive reintegration of elements, retro elements, you can change uh, gene expression in such a way that it creates malformed uh, bodies, which can make, can create the whole new uh, version of uh, maintained breeds with stable characteristics. In this case, we do it, but in that case, nature did it. And simply, uh, eventually, if we keep these breeds of dogs long enough, they will evolve into separate species. But it will probably will take tens of thousands of years. So, uh, and the other thing which is most probably uh, depressing about dogs is that how short their life is. Mm. I'm sure that every dog lover and majority of humans are belong to this category. You remember the grieving about dying dog uh, because for years it was your best friend and you, uh, within human life, you may have 10 dogs' lives. And every time 
you lose it and uh, you you grieve about that as as a, as about close friend so it looks very i would say unjustified to to have it and th these are big animals the animals you know they are so big dogs they are actually comparable in size to humans why do they live such a short life and this short life is extremely well uh you know uh, determined by genes we know that every mammalian species has longevity which is very well genetically inherited so which means that this clock which is ticking in dogs and in us is genetically determined so if the theory which i has been telling you about is right then this clock consists of two major factors one is the degree of uh con degree of strictness of negative control of retrobiome mm -hmm. and and second is the how long does immune system can control it so uh both both factors contribute to their longevity if you have certain degree of in of uh, risk of activation of <clears throat> retrobiome in somatic cells and you have it much more frequent than in humans for example then the immune system which is uh, working in eliminating such cells may become exhausted faster or if immune immune senescence for some reason occurs easier in one species versus another then you start counting your days you know earlier than others and you start getting frail so from from everything i told you <clears throat> dogs seem to be an ideal model yep. from all standpoints because it's longevity is short so you you have time for experimentation we love them so which means that everything we do to extend their longevity will be very well wanted and yep. we will definitely be happy to do that three whatever we learn on dogs can be much easier translated to humans than from mice uh, 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 and <clears throat> finally uh, the dog's genetics gives us hints that these processes which according to this theory are drivers of aging indeed happen in them mm -hmm. much more efficiently than in others all this together brought us to the idea that dogs might be a great model not only to study aging but also to intervene it <laughs> and another thing is that it is pretty well known that aging that um drugs which were uh, developed for example for hiv which i mentioned already <clears throat> some of them were tested on dogs mm -hmm. and some of them already know the uh, the limits of the concentration and the pharmacological properties and so on <laughs> all this together brought us to the um, idea to start using dogs as uh, uh, as a model for not only studying aging by also to intervening age mm -hmm. and uh, fortunately for us there are people who um, <clears throat> are ready to provide generous support for that and uh, we hope that uh, these uh, will continue and uh, with the generation of new data we will be engaging more and more enthusiasm and support for this project but we uh, had uh, generous supporters among dog lovers who gave us resources to initiate this activity as i as you said it's not for profit organization so it's an organization which is not made to make money it's pure with purely humanitarian goal uh, to learn how to treat aging in dogs and eventually in everybody else uh, this um, organization uh, is a uh, spin-off of these ideas which i told you about mm -hmm. uh, but it is not in the place where i work because uh, i'm working in cancer center which treats with humans but it's naturally should be part of the uh, big veterinary uh, school and uh, one of the best schools in the country is cornell university school of veterinary which is located three hours uh, driving uh, to the south from Buffalo, where my center is, uh, 
in Ithaca, New York. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, um, this is the place where Vika's dog facility is located. And other founding um, parameters when we created Vika was the very important axiom, which is laid as a motherboard in this undertaking. We are not doing interventional, uh, any harm causing, you know, uh, experiments with dogs. Sure. We are creating conditions when these dogs live as happy life as one could imagine. And we are not doing things which cause even slight harm to these animals. Yep. So I want to give credit to, to several people. First, of course, to those who are supporting us. Uh, I didn't uh, ask for their permission to disclose their names, but this, without these people, it all would not be possible. Second, I want to um, give credit to those who are um, driving this undertaking. And uh, uh, Vika uh, has uh, um, two scientists uh, who uh, are uh, behind this program, uh, co-founders with me. It's Daria Fleischmann and Katerina Andrianova president and vice president of Vika, and you can read about all of us on our website vika.org and a very substantial part of credit should go to uh, several faculty of cornell university the number one of which is uh, dr joseph wachschlag professor wachschlag actually is the author uh, of the main idea not idea what to treat and how about retrobiome. This came from us. Okay. But the idea how to organize the whole study, because initially we thought that we will be working with household dogs. We thought that we will be, you know, just um, establish a network of uh, connections with households, with dog owners. We'll give them the drug. We'll ask them to keep records of what's going on with dogs. We will be asking for certain, uh, you know, parameters to measure, to certain, you know, maybe maybe some veterinarian visits or something like that. It and we even started creating the plan for that, and we know that there are studies in this country. Uh, for example, one of them is uh, run by Dr. Promislow, uh, uh, who is testing rapamycin uh, as a, a potential rejuvenating agent in dogs, uh, which is based on household, <clears throat> but. Um, this this type of study would be tremendously confounded by the diversity of um, habits, of diversity of owners, uh, uh, diversity of dog breeds, <clears throat> diversity of uh, you know nu nu nutrition, uh, diversity of lifestyle. So so many different factors which will be enormously different in from one home to another and also we all know some people will be accurate uh, you know reporters of what's going on some people will be not some people will have their fantasies you know they put there so in order to make that study convincing the numbers should be like thousands right. if not ten thousands uh, and we know this very well because we are running clinical trials in oncology and we are quite sophisticated in that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, however, Joe Wachschlag, when we uh, exposed him to this general idea, he came up with a brilliant solution. He says, guys, there are plenty of um, uh, companies all over the country in the northern part of the United States and in Canada uh, who are keeping sled dogs. And uh, these sled dogs, they obviously, like any type of sports, it's based on the healthy and young dogs. And at a certain point of their life, they are no longer usable. So, and the, and the kind of future of these dogs, when they reach the age, when they start declining, and when they're most interesting to us, mm -hmm. is the time when the owners try to get rid of them. <clears throat> and again, some owners would probably provide them with a certain degree of good retirement. Uh, some <clears throat> owners would try to give them to shelters. You know, you never know. But the fact is that old sled dogs is a problem. And by collecting these dogs, on one hand, we can collect dogs which have a similar background in terms of their history. Mm -hmm. 
much less, still big, but much less broad diversity in terms of their genetics. Uh, and we can bring them all to a, one facility where we can unify their, the way how they are maintained, what they eat, what they do, how they exercise, and uh, that will create conditions for experimentalists incomparably better and much better controlled. And remember, it's happening in one of the best schools of veterinary in the country, so mean under control of faculty who would make sure, and uh, graduate students and uh, veterinary students who would, uh, whose profession is to uh, basically do research on, on animals. And uh, believe it or not that all this was implemented in VICA. Hmm. So uh, besides Joe Wachschlag, we have uh, two other faculty members who played and keep playing a pivotal role in VICA. Uh, it's Heather Husson, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, John Loftus, uh, uh, the veterinarian geneticist and, uh, uh, veterinar and uh, cl veterinarian clinician who are uh, part of our kind of leadership team around research, which our team has uh, established and brought to them to help shape it up and then, ex and then actually uh, uh, De deliver, conduct. So what, how this all organized? So first of all, in order to do that, we had to buy a truck <laughs> to collect all this, uh, all these dogs from all over the country. And here, uh, you know, enthusiastic uh, students and founders were driving uh, all over the country to pick dogs from multiple facilities, from Michigan, from Wisconsin, from uh, Washington State, uh, and uh, bring them little by little to this facility, which uh, was renovated for us. It's a special big house, which is the home of about 100 retired sled dogs, and uh, uh, which came, as I said, from all over the country, uh, which uh, were treated and vaccinated and adapted to the same type of food who are have a excellent conditions of life because not only they are living and very well fed but they are uh, they have uh, twice a day they exercise they have a huge yard to run around uh, and these dogs actually uh, they have lots of human attention not only because they're well maintained but because we're doing lots of tests on them because aging is not only uh, longevity Aging is frailty, and frailty is, has multiple manifestations. It's obviously, there are biochemical and uh, physiological manifestations, such as, for example, reduced ability to exercise. So we have a uh, trade mill for dogs, for example, with, with a necessary computer uh, infrastructure, which can uh, uh, record how easy every dog uh, you know, can, how long every dog can run and what are their heart beating, what is their cytokine release, so what is happening in the body and all this type of stuff. We have cognitive tests which are run on these dogs. We're looking at how their creativity, how their interaction with humans, how interaction with toys, with, with a mirror occurs. And all this is recorded and digitized and turned into the uh, digital numbers which can be analyzed eventually quantitatively. Mm -hmm. So this is a huge undertaking. Obviously, the, uh, the ability to be vaccinated is another thing. The quality of the immune system. All dogs undergo uh, computer scanning. So looking for, the, uh, for hidden tumors, for arthritis and other internal diseases. So basically, they are, coming, they are passing through the most uh, comprehensive uh, you know, health care. Mm -hmm. uh, not only health care, but also health examination. For every dog, there is a huge growing file, which first consists of baseline parameters, and then dogs were randomized into two groups. Randomized into two groups. One of the group is receiving every day placebo, which is just nice piece of a treat. Yep. And the other group is receiving placebo, which includes inside itself a pill 
with anti-HIV drugs. The one which was picked for its ability to be effective against line one reverse transcriptase. Obviously, to do that, we had to go through the pharmacological characterization of how this drug gets metabolized and what is the right dose, and we had to do many adjustments. And we did all this. And now every dog, every life for a whole year already is, uh, has been receiving lamivudine, the drug which is an inhibitor of reverse transcriptase, which is being used in humans and which is appeared to be completely benign for these dogs because we didn't see any side effects or any, because obviously if there would be any indications of side effects, the experiment would be immediately stopped. I told you that we are caring about uh, dogs' health. Of course. So, and then we will be, based on this baseline databases, we'll be creating this baselines every next year for the whole group of dogs. Obviously, on the way, we are recording everything which has happened with their life. And we will be monitoring what is happening with the progression of their aging in the group which is on the drug versus the group which is on placebo. Right. We are obviously adding to this uh, study another direction which involves drugs which counteract immune senescence. But this is something which happened next year. But right now, I'm, I'm just telling you about this Lamivudin study, which because it's already ongoing. But and uh, obviously, we are we would have the first results of the first year of treatment ready by now. Unfortunately, COVID nineteen situation, which mm. le led to the closure of Cornell University, mm, put this um, time point into jeopardy, and we had to postpone this measurement till June. But it's not a big deal for us. It's just, you know, we're just getting impatient, of course, but sure. uh, dogs keep being treated. But this is not all, because in parallel, what we could do, we could, uh, we are using these dogs as the uh, source of genetic material, hey, taking uh, DNA from uh, their saliva or from their blood, you know, something which can be easily taken to measure what is happening in the genomes yep. of dogs during natural aging. And with, I don't want to tell too much about that because it will be published in the paper we are preparing right now, but I can tell you the ultimate result. It appears that dog DNA in somatic tissues is, becomes different with every next year of life in terms of acquisition of more and more etrotra elements in that DNA. So our DNA, at least DNA of dogs, is indeed undergoes aging according to the rules which we kind of proclaimed and predicted based on the theory I told you. That's going to be a very fascinating paper to read. <laughs> I, I, thought you were going to, I thought you were going to give me the conclusion, but I, no, that's, um, yeah, uh, that, that's striking. Um, so I obviously would like to, uh, besides the pleasure of uh, telling you the whole story of Vika and giving you the, some overview of the scale of the work which is being done, right. I want to say that A, a lot more can be done uh, on this unique population of animals yep. with extra funding available. and. Uh, we really are very open for donations because that it will be immediately, remember it's not for profit organization. Sure. Every dollar <clears throat> is put back into research to, and uh, all the results will be available to everybody, you know, with no limits. Uh, and uh, um, obviously we would like everybody who happened to listen to this interview to go to our website and uh, uh, look through that because many more details can be learned looking at uh, what's going on. We are fortunate to have a very um, uh, really amazingly powerful board of directors. Uh, among our directors who are overseeing this exercise are is um, uh, people like Dr. Rodney Page, who is a uh, director of the biggest in the country animal cancer center, Flint Cancer Center in Colorado. Okay. 
uh, Dr. Cynthia Otter from Philadelphia, who is the mm, well, probably the biggest national expert in cognitive uh, studies of in dogs and uh, running the program of uh, uh, extending, and she's very interested in VICA as uh, a possibility of extending life and uh, health of dogs with uh, sophisticated cognitive uh, habits and cognitive skills, such as police dogs, for example because they said there is a plenty of useful things besides pleasure of having com companion longer living. So, um, which means that we are in, we indeed fortunate to have best imaginable experts in, uh, in dog biology. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I said, we will be hopefully more and more visible when we start, uh, you know, uh, on, unloading the outcome of our studies in the form of scientific papers. Absolutely. It's very exciting. It's, uh, I mean, you obviously have put together um, the right protocols, the right team. Um, you know, unfortunately, we're all affected by COVID, but uh, it seems that things are nonetheless uh, moving forward. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's fascinating to hear a story like this uh, obviously, we hear a lot about yeast and, and Drosophila and worms and, and mice, but to move to a, a large mammal like this um, in, in a large population with all of these controls, as you were saying, um, is a major next step in, in this uh, health span, lifespan um, story. And I think it's, it's amazing. And I really... Uh, I'm going to be keep keep looking at it and, and watching you. And uh, once again, everybody um, that's going to be watching on um, the YouTube channel or listening on the various podcast networks, um, you've been you've been listening to the fascinating Dr. Andre Goodkov. Uh, check out the Vika Project. Uh, I think it's v-a-i-k-a dot org. Uh, and you can really see a lot more about this amazing work at the same time. Um, Dr. Vaikov is uh, Senior Vice President, Research Technology Innovation at the uh, Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center, doing a lot of other things uh, for us uh, in terms of human health and cancer uh, prevention and protecting our genomes. Um, Dr. Kukov, it's been a it's been a real eye-opening pleasure hearing uh, this story. Any any final words about uh, anything else that uh, you want to mention while we have you? Yes, uh, I think that a lot in um, our ability to um, make a difference uh, is based on our psychology. Mm. I think for years, aging has been on the mm, kind of a back, on the back of science. So basically, it was not in the front of the stage of major things we were dealing with. Right. And the reason for that, I think, is purely psychological. We have been looking into aging as a law of nature. And we have been thinking about anti-aging research as uh, equivalent to the attempt to make perpetuum mobile. Mm -hmm. mm. uh, because every, there's no exception. Every single person around us gets uh, aged and dies and frail. Uh, I think that the whole change of perception which we are experiencing, witnessing, and participating in right now will change life of um, humans and human companions uh, in a very reasonable time. And we start seeing fruits of that as we speak. Outstanding, outstanding. Uh, Dr. Gukov, um, thank you for taking the time to come on the show today. Um, thank you for what you do, not just for the humans, but for the dogs. Uh, and as we say uh, on this show, thank you for moving the human and the canine story forward, because as you say, this is, um, um, these types of results uh, are going to change everything. <laughs> and, uh, you know, what you're doing is really uh, crossing the boundaries to this translational reality that too often we don't uh, we don't see beyond the bend so it's it's really fascinating once again thank you for for taking the time to come on and, and really go so in-depth into to everything it's been really eye-opening thank you ira thank you for the opportunity definitely good luck with all your projects